the pyramids, the great sphinx, the hieroglyphs, the mummies, Egypt. A powerful ancient civilization flourished here and its people gave thanks to their many gods for their environment. The Nile provided the necessities of life while the desert offered protection. During much of its development, ancient Egypt was stable, leaving time to create, to prosper, and time to question the existence of man. The great pyramids of ancient Egypt are recognizable throughout the world. These fascinating treasures are the tangible links to the secrets from long ago, and through them, the ancient Egyptian is revealed. The ancient Egyptian story is one of ingenuity, where imagination overlaps with intellect, religion intertwined with mythology, and abstract ideas molded the real world. Everything in the Egyptian culture revolved around a mysterious belief system, with its roots firmly planted in the unknown. The pyramids protected it, the statues emphasized it, the sacred carvings explained it, the treasures ensured it, but it was the mummy that embodied it. The mummy was the ancient Egyptians' chief weapon in the war they had waged against their own mortality. And for the pharaoh, the pyramids served as the portal to the other side. The evolution began during Egypt's pre-dynastic days when dead bodies were buried away from fertile ground for practical reasons. In the earliest burials, there was no attempt at artificial preservation. The body was simply hunched up and laid in a shallow pit of sand. The natural drying effects of the desert sand against the skin resulted in a well-preserved human form, a human form that would last thousands of years unless outside forces interfered. When you're in a country where you're burying people mostly in shallow graves in sand, which are easy to dig up, you have wild animals who come to uh, look for a snack in the necropolis. Uh, after grandpa has been dead and you come back to the tomb, you discover that he's lying on the ground sort of looking at you. And they seem to have gotten the idea that grandpa is still around as long as his body is still around. The ancient Egyptians embraced the natural preservation process by first trying to explain it and then by trying to emulate it. Here is where funerary preparation began. Attempts were being made to preserve the body from the very beginning of what we call the dynastic period, going back to about 3000 BC, because fragments of bodies had been found uh, that had been carefully wrapped and it would seem that in those early days they had no conception of what exactly happened to a body after burial and so they thought that by wrapping it up carefully they might actually preserve it. Early experiments at preservation failed. The secret of natural mummification was dehydration caused by a combination of sun and sand against the skin. But when the body was covered it no longer dried out so it decomposed. The ancients realized they were actually destroying what they were trying to protect. It was then they began to develop the process of artificial mummification. They believed, once dead, a person would split into separate parts. The first being the physical body, the second, the person's spiritual double, or the ka, and the third, the deceased's personality, known as the ba, which is often depicted in ancient relief as a human-headed bird. When these somewhat more formless parts of you recognized your original outline, boom, they came back in, having found this template, and that allowed that final transformation to take place, this final kind of resurrection on the other side of death. This final transformation 
enabled the reunited Ba and Ka to become what the ancient Egyptians called an Ak, a glorified being of light. For the ancients, mummification was essential for the dead to complete this final transformation. They hoped to preserve the physical body through the artificial process, and they hoped to preserve the spiritual aspects through prayers and offerings. If everything was done correctly, they believed a person could live forever. A whole industry grew out of the need for preserving the human body. In ancient Egypt, mummification was big business. If your body couldn't be preserved, then obviously you couldn't resurrect. You went out of existence. You didn't get to make it to the next world. The Egyptians didn't have a concept of hell. There was either continued existence or out of existence, no existence. When a body was brought to the embalmers, they produced sample statues in wood, painted to resemble the deceased. The best and most expensive was life-sized and brightly painted. The second best was somewhat inferior and less expensive. And a third statue was the least expensive. After pointing to these differences in quality, the embalmers would ask which of the three was desired. The relatives of the dead man agreed on the price and then would depart, leaving the embalmers to their work. The embalmer's shop was known as the Tent of Purification. It was there that the most elaborate process of mummification was performed. It was a process that lasted 70 days and began with the dehydration of the body. The artificial mummification was basically dehydration. That was the most important thing. The first thing was they had to remove all the soft organs in the body. A scribe would mark the body where the incision was to be made. Then the one called the slitter cuts the flesh with an Ethiopian stone and at once takes to flight, while those present set out after him, pelting him with stones, keeping curses on him. For in their eyes, everyone is an object of general hatred who applies violence to the body of the same tribe. Diodorus, Greek historian, 59 BC. The embalmers who were highly regarded in Egyptian society gathered around the corpse. Then one of the men would thrust his hand into the open wound. Through an abdominal incision, a very small abdominal incision, the liver, the kidneys, the intestines were removed because they're moist and you had to get rid of moisture. After this, they filled the cavity with the purest bruised myrrh, with cassia and every other sort of spicery except frankincense. Herodotus, Greek historian, 450 BC. Also the brain was removed and that's the thing that's the most difficult and perhaps for which the Egyptians are the most famous. They removed the brain through an incision in the nose. They went in through the nose, broke through a bone called the ethnoid bone, which is basically behind your eyes, into the cranium. And then with a long hook tool, went inside and removed the brain a piece at a time. So for 35 days, after the organs are removed, the body stays in its natron, which is a dehydrating agent. It's found naturally in Egypt. It's basically baking soda and table salt. Then the remainder of the ritual is performed. Along with the physical mummification came the spiritual aspect, the religious aspect. While the embalmers were the technicians, there were also, of course, a host of priests who officiated at this mummification service with the rituals. In strange costumes, priests whispered spells to ensure the safe transition of the dead to the other side. O oh, sweet-smelling soul of the great god, thou dost contain such odor that thy face shall neither change nor perish. After reciting some magical words, the bandaging would begin. 
The dehydrated body was covered in a mixture of oils and spices. Then, a protective coating was applied to prevent moisture. Early travelers to Egypt thought this substance was mamiya, an oily material found in Persia. From this misconception comes the word mummy. Incantations accompanied that part of the process as well. Grant thou that breathing may take place in the head of the deceased in the underworld, and that he may see with his eyes, and that he may hear with his two ears, and that he may breathe through his nose, and that he may be able to utter sounds with his mouth, and that he may be able to speak with his tongue in the underworld. Ancient Egyptian spell. The mummy was a result of the ancient Egyptians' mythology. Osiris, the king of the dead, was known as the first of the Westerners. It was the legendary rebirth of his body that gave rise to a belief in life after death. Osiris became the symbol of resurrection. There is a lot of difference in how, during certain periods or within certain social classes, they would manifest that belief. But that is the belief which is the most important, the belief in life after death. This is held true by all of the population, really through all periods of Egyptian religion. Another very important common feature is the importance of the sun, the solar cults. This gave the Egyptians the guarantee and the, the hope that they would always be reborn, just to, to link their own psyches with the solar cycle. In the depths of the night, the sun would somehow join with Osiris, with the power of rejuvenation, receive the power of rebirth, and be able to proceed through the underworld, conquering all the dangers that it met, and rise again to life in the morning. The ancient Egyptians' concept of the afterlife for a human being was much the same thing. The body had to overcome the same dangers that the sun did. It was a process that the person had to go through every day. And that's why you needed a mummy, because the mummy was to the individual dead person like the cosmic mummy of Osiris was to the sun. It is the site of rejuvenation, the site where you uh, join this power of coming back to life again. For the ancient Egyptian, ensuring immortality was more than just preparation of the mummy. There was a need to protect it as well. To achieve that, the ancient Egyptians designed the Great Pyramids, some of the most remarkable monuments the world would ever know. They are the last of the seven wonders of the world to remain. They are the enduring symbols that illuminate the pages of history. They are the Pyramids of Giza. They have been contemporaries of lost empires. They have seen civilizations that we have never known, understood languages that we try to guess through hieroglyphics, known customs that to us seem as fantastical as a dream. They have been there so long that even the stars have changed positions in the sky. Théophile Gautier, French author, 1869. These great forms rise out of the desert like ships upon an ocean of sand. The sight is and always has been overwhelming. The color is a surprise. Few persons can be aware beforehand of the rich, tawny hue that Egyptian limestone assumes after ages of exposure to the blaze of an Egyptian sky. Seen in certain lights, the pyramids look like piles of massy gold. Amelia Edwards, founder of the Egypt Exploration Society, 1877. The pyramids of Giza seem to have cast a spell that even science cannot break. For many, it's impossible to imagine man having the ability to produce such imposing, innovative, and exquisitely designed structures. In fact, so impossible that even aliens have been credited with their construction. Yet these monuments were created by human beings. 
human beings focused on protecting their lifestyle throughout eternity. And for over 4,000 years, they have withstood the sands of time. The pyramids of Giza were the tombs of kings. They too were part of the ancient Egyptians' funerary preparations. The tombs are called, among other things, houses of eternity. And so since they were very aware that they were going to live longer dead than they were going to live alive on Earth, they wanted to perpetuate their existence. And so whether it's a pyramid tomb or whether it's a mastaba tomb or whether it's a rock cut tomb or whether it's a uh, shallow pit in the desert, the Egyptians wanted to uh, have their life and take their life with them. 4,600 years ago, the pyramids were just as important as the mummy. They were the monumental casings that protected the body of the dead pharaoh. Pyramids represent the culmination of the many grand ideas that developed over a period of hundreds of years. There is something curious about them, these famous pyramids. The more one looks at them, the bigger they become. Gustave Flaubert, traveler in Egypt, 1849. Throughout history, these massive mounds have been credited with mysterious and magical capabilities. Yet, if the pyramids of Giza truly possess special powers, it is thanks to man's imagination, not some otherworldly force. It was the ancient Egyptians' desperate search for answers that caused them to find meaning in everything, including a pointed pile of stone. Nobody wakes up one day and says, ooh, the pyramid has a magical shape, it's gonna have tremendous powers. It's really an architectural development that happened over several hundred years. Tombs went from simple sand burials to structures known as mastabans. Mastaba, of course, is the Arabic word for bench because they're flat and they look like brownies or pieces of cake. They look like the benches outside the modern village houses. It's a rectangular structure. It looks like a house. In fact, it was referred to as a house or house of eternity in ancient Egypt. In a mastaba tomb, the burial is in an underground room reached by a long vertical shaft. The body is in that area and is completely made inaccessible by filling the shaft up with, with stone. Then in 2600 BC, during the Third Dynasty, there was a change in tomb construction when a king known as Zosher commissioned the building of his tomb. A creative designer named Imhotep used his artistic genius to produce the first Egyptian pyramid, the Step Pyramid of Saqqara. Imhotep planned the placement of mastaba on top of mastaba. The result? a multi-tiered structure that the ancients would later give significance. The pyramid shape was just a way to get something really high. In any sort of pre-industrial society, if you want to build something that's really tall and you don't have steel skeletons framework, you have to just sort of pile stuff up. And it sort of naturally takes this kind of lump form. It was simply stability that seems to have been the key for opening the door to designing such massive structures. Scholars believe this understanding was part of the evolution of man's ideas concerning construction. They claim that is the reason pyramids are found throughout the world. The ancients linked magical powers to the shape of the pyramid. The mound design was symbolic of the mysterious origins of life itself. The Egyptians believed that this universe began with a mound which rose from the waters of chaos. That idea came from the annual inundation of Egypt, when, as it was receding, mounds rose above. You had water all around them. According to legend, a lotus grew out of the primordial mound, and from that lotus emerged the sun god, and from the sun god, all creation. The pyramid for the ancient Egyptians is, in a sense, nothing more than that little mound of earth that you make around a seed. The mummy of the king lying in the depths of the pyramid is like a seed waiting to come to life again. 
and the pyramid itself is in a sense the mound of earth that gives it the potentiality to come to life again. The step pyramid set a new standard of tomb style for the Egyptian pharaoh, but for 200 years it would continually be improved. The end result, one of the seven wonders of the world, the pyramids of Giza. Centuries before building the pyramids of Giza, the ancients increased their knowledge of pyramid construction. Over a period of 200 years, they made impressive developments in both the pyramid's design and its significance. It is a gathering of marvels to confound the mind. The more one looks upon them, the greater grows the admiration they inspire. Abdel Latif, Arab doctor, 1200 AD. As time passed, the pyramid's original stepped shape gave way to the sleekness of smooth siding. During one of their architectural advances, the ancients filled in the steps. This change in style gave the monumental tombs new meaning. The pyramid is a solar symbol associated originally with the stars, and not too long after that, judging by the transition between the Step Pyramid of Zosar at Saqqara and the uh, Great Pyramids and the Giza Plateau, associated with the rising and setting of the sun. Experts also claim that the pyramid's shape is like a symbolic representation of the ancient Egyptians' social structure, the bottom being the square world with the masses at its base. Then, as the pyramid stretches upward, there's a climb through the different classes within the culture. Once at the top, the highest point, the pyramid ends with room to represent only one, the almighty Pharaoh. May heaven strengthen the sun's rays for you so that you may ascend to heaven as the eye of Ra. Ancient Egyptian cult text. The pyramids of Giza are some of the most striking monuments of all time. These magnificent mountains of stone have no equivalent in size or stature. They are the stunning reminders of a long lost world where fear and hope inspired man to create on a grand scale. They were constructed early in Egyptian history during the fourth dynasty, a period within the old kingdom dating back to around 2500 BC. They were built when perhaps the ancients' techniques for pyramid construction were at their finest. And eventually, they became known for the three kings that had them built. The smallest of the three was named after Menkore, whom the Greeks called Mycernerus. The middle one, the one with a battered upper casing, belonged to Kafra, whom the Greeks called Kephron, the father of Menkare. And then there's the Great Pyramid, the Pyramid of Khufu, whom the Greeks called Cheops, the father of Kephron and grandfather of Menkare. Together, they form an awe-inspiring chain. Like man-made towers, they loom high above. Throughout the centuries, many travelers have insisted upon climbing one of the three staircases to try to capture their magic, if only for one moment. It was as if one had been snatched up for an instant to some vast height overlooking the plains of time, and it seemed two centuries mapped out beneath one's feet. Amelia Edwards, founder of the Egypt Exploration Society, 1877. These man-made monuments were designed to last for eternity, and so far, that's exactly what they've done. Even Napoleon recognized the importance of the pyramids on an expedition in Egypt in 1798. For centuries, the construction techniques of these pyramids has been in question. They would be considered an engineering feat for any time, but most especially for ancient man. It's difficult to imagine the ancient Egyptians calculating their measurements so precisely. 
but somehow that's exactly what they did. Remarkably, the sides of them are perfectly formed triangles. How the Egyptians quarried, cut, and transported all the granite to the Giza Plateau is a mystery. Using the tools and technology of the time, it would have been virtually impossible. So what is the explanation? We have monumental inscriptions, we have official texts, we have temple archives, but we don't have individual letters of people actually involved in hauling those stones up the mud brick ramps and building the pyramid. It'd be nice if we did. The pyramids of Giza were symbolic for the ancients, and they are for modern man as well. They have become the massive reminders of a world where men could be called upon to help construct images for their leader. These man-made mountains moving up the sides with the use of ramps until the pyramid grew to the level desired. Other experts believe the ancients built a coiled ramp with platforms to surround the pyramid which enabled teams of men to place the heavy stones into position. Perhaps even more mind-boggling than the question of how the pyramids were built is the question of who built them. Throughout the ages, slaves have been credited with their construction, but Egyptologists believe otherwise. I tend to look at the pyramids as not some kind of massive construction project of slave labor when everyone is toiling in pain and torture, but rather a massive national construction project with everything. Pyramids tell little of the genius behind the skillful engineering needed for their sturdy construction, but much about man's determination. After all, it is believed that they were built by using unlimited labor, countless men willing to work until the job was done. The theories of just how they were constructed vary. Some experts believe laborers harnessed to sledges dragged the blocks of stone over a damp layer of silt so the sledges could slide. They would then continue this process slowly. Everyone involved looking to support this concept of order by guaranteeing a successful afterlife for the king, by completing this mortuary complex, you're really doing a kind of a national project that guarantees the, uh, the prosperity of the whole culture. They were sort of like giant WPA projects, particularly during periods when the Nile overflowed its banks. You had all these farmers with nothing to do, so you paid your taxes and labor. There were full-time people who worked there all year round, but I think they may have also had sort of conscript labor to help both quarry the blocks and, and ship them and, and uh, put them into place. So it wasn't slavery, it was their economic solution to keeping people employed. The Pyramid of Khufu is taller than the Statue of Liberty, the Taj Mahal, and St. Peter's Basilica. It was the tallest structure in the world until the Eiffel Tower was built in 1889. Yet its size has little to do with its function. It was built for the ancient Egyptian ruler, not for the ancient Egyptian religion. We can trace the development of the pyramid historically from mounds of earth that were heaped up over graves to larger mounds of earth that were heaped up over the larger tombs of kings until eventually you get to the Great Pyramid of Giza, which is the largest mound of anything that's ever been heaped up uh, by a human being. All of them have the same purpose. All of them have the same function. And to the ancient Egyptian, all of them would have functioned uh, just as effectively. So that the matter of size is a matter more of, of ego than anything else. Size may have been secondary when it came to the purpose of the pyramid, but for magic to happen, a north-facing entrance was imperative. The pyramid's door was aligned with the circumpolar stars, or what the ancients called the indestructibles. These were the only stars that never seemed to move. They were eternal. For the pharaoh, they provided the perfect destination for a man in search of eternal life. The king's tomb has more cosmic uh, themes because the king's household has more cosmic concerns as the head of the entire Egyptian nation. The king is making the connection between the gods and people. He's half god and he's half man. It was important the king reach the other side. The ancient Egyptian civilization depended on it. To ensure the safety of this journey, 
the ancients built a labyrinth of passageways that still beckon modern man. For the ancient Egyptian, the ruling pharaoh was half god, half man. He was the human representation of the god Horus. Horus was the son of Osiris. He was also the god of the living. The king, as a divine being, was responsible for maintaining order in the ancient civilization. The Egyptians did not really see and the cosmos as running according to laws and as everything's gonna work out. No, it required a great deal of effort. And one of the tasks of the king was to daily ensure that there wouldn't be a collapse of the world. The responsibilities of the Pharaoh did not end with the death of his physical body. Once dead, the king made a transformation. He changed from Horus into Osiris. As king of the dead, the pharaoh would continue to watch over his earthly concerns from beyond. To prevent chaos, he had to reach the other side. The pyramids, both inside and out, were constructed with that in mind. The Great Pyramid has long waged an archeological war. Years have been spent in studying it. In the absence of information, Many have constructed their own theories as to why it was built. But even today, no one has the real answer. In the Great Pyramid of Khufu, the entrance passageway points to the circumpolar stars as it slopes down a long tunnel, only four feet wide, and a little over three feet high. This passageway seems airless and never ending. Yet after a downwards climb of 320 feet, this underground shaft gives way to the gloominess of an unfinished room. There is no place in the world that is deeper in the bowels of the bedrock, danker and darker than the chambers underneath the large pyramids. If you're under there at high noon, you're as separated from the world of sunlight as you can possibly be. So in that sense, the inner chambers and passages of the pyramid are very Earth-like. The subterranean chamber was originally intended as a resting place for the pharaoh's mummy. It would serve as the mound that covered the king, whose body was like a seed that would sprout back to life. But something went wrong. According to scholars, the reason the work below may have been abandoned could have been the direct result of a development in Egyptian religion. They claim it was during the construction of this pyramid when the king decided that his mummy had to be buried not just in a tomb, but in a stone sarcophagus within that tomb. The sarcophagus was called Possessor of Life, Neb Ankh. And so when the king was laid back into the sarcophagus, which is stone, a symbol of the earth, he was also put back into the womb of his mother, who is Nut, the sky goddess. In other words, it's like being born into the sky again. So very clearly for the Egyptians, they were saying that the womb and the tomb are identical at this level of kingship when you're dealing with these cosmic principles. So when the king survived death, he was reborn into the sky, as well as being reborn in the underworld, in the domain of Osiris. All these ideas were blended in Egyptian worldview without any sense of contradiction. The stone sarcophagus was one more way to ensure the pharaoh's safe passage to the other side. But in the case of the Great Pyramid, it presented a problem. This large, heavy object would not fit through the descending passageway in order to get into the tomb chamber. You can see today where they were working probably one morning and stopped abruptly in the afternoon and decided to change the plan and have the chamber for the sarcophagus in the 
superstructure in the body of the pyramid, something that they'd never done before. An ascending passageway was cut through some of the stones already in place. This tunnel rises 125 feet before leveling off into what's known as the Queen's Chamber. The Queen's Chamber is considered a misnomer. It was merely the name coined by Arab visitors that thought it resembled the contemporary tombs of their women. Interestingly, the Queen's Chamber, like the subterranean chamber, was also left unfinished. Once again, the sarcophagus is thought to have been the reason. Some experts believe it was not completed in time, so the ancient workers built on. What a gloomy, forbidding place. Into our faces, drafts of the stifling air, superheated by the suns of 5,000 years, which have shone upon the pyramid until it glows like a furnace. James Henry Breasted, 1905. As the Pyramid of Khufu continued its rise, another corridor was added within this massive structure known as the Grand Gallery. The perspiration pours down our faces as we rest after the ascent. We are at the top of the Grand Hall and are looking down its slippery slope, congratulating ourselves that we have reached the level at the top. The ascent of the hall is none too easy. James Henry Breasted, 1905. This 153-foot-long vaulted passageway ends in a red granite room, the final resting place for the pharaoh. At the far end of the chamber is the red granite sarcophagus of the ancient king for whom the Great Pyramid was built. It measures over seven feet in length and a little over three feet in width. Here is supposed to have slept one of the greatest rulers of the earth, the king of the then greatest kingdom of the world, the proud mortal for which this mighty structure was raised. The dimensions of this sarcophagus have been carefully studied. They are interesting in that they make this object too large to fit through the entrance into the chamber causing experts to conclude that it must have been placed there during the pyramid's construction. Deep in the heart of the Great Pyramid, and before us is the sarcophagus in which the king was entombed. See how the tomb robbers have broken away the corner in their mad search for treasure. There his body was torn from its resting place. James Henry Breasted, 1905. According to the Egyptians' beliefs, once the pharaoh was mummified and his body was set inside his sarcophagus, he would then rise up and out of the pyramid. By moving the burial chamber into the body of the structure, the ancients feared the original entrance would be too difficult for the dead ruler to find. The Egyptians realized that this was a problem, and so they had a model shaft that came down from the northern face of the Great Pyramid, so the king had a way of his spirit to go up to him. The Egyptians believed in balance in both art and architecture. Therefore, they constructed a model shaft in the southern wall of Khufu to match the one inside the northern wall. They then had a pair, giving the king two options. He could either rise up to the circumpolar stars or find his way to the constellation of Orion. The shafts, the passageways, and the almost 60 million tons of rock found in the Pyramid of Khufu represent the importance the ancients placed in a life beyond death. This pyramid deserves its many boastful titles. After all, it is by far one of the grandest monuments ever designed by man. It's strange, but it seems as if time began somewhere within its stone frame. We scrambled about a good deal in this mountain and came out glad to have seen the wonderful interior, but welcoming the burst of white light and the pure air as if we were being born again. To remain long in that gulf of mortality is to experience something of the mystery of death. 
Charles Dudley Warner, 1884. By being buried within the pyramid, the pharaoh had every assurance that he would achieve immortality. This massive tomb was his final stop before embarking on his eternal expedition. Each pyramid is a mortuary complex, so it consists of not only of the tomb of the king, but also a pyramid temple built right next to the pyramid, then a causeway leading down to the Nile Valley, and then a valley temple. That's the royal mortuary complex. The whole thing was a kind of port authority for the journey into the afterlife. Instead of taking a Greyhound bus, you were taking whatever cosmic ship you needed to travel with the sun god, to go to the imperishable stars, uh, to go to the various destinations of the king in the afterlife. And in fact, in the case of the Khufu pyramid complex, you had great boat pits where they actually buried real boats. In 1954, workmen intent on clearing rubble from the base of the Great Pyramid found a wall that covered a 12-foot deep pit. Sealed inside this pit was wood from trees found only in Lebanon. There were 1,204 pieces in all, and they had been undisturbed since the time of Khufu. It took 16 years for archaeologists to remove and then reassemble all the fragments. The end result was a 143-foot boat that could actually float on water. Many scholars believe that this boat was somehow involved in Khufu's funeral. They're not quite sure exactly how it was used, but claim that it possibly carried the king's treasures that at one time were buried along with him inside of the pyramid. Upon death, the pharaoh did not lose his earthly status. He maintained his position even in the world beyond, bringing with him all the pleasures he enjoyed in life and tombed in magnificent splendor in the great pyramids of the Giza. Off the east coast of Australia, up to 200 kilometers offshore, a line of surf rises out of the open ocean.
Beneath the surface, creating these breaking waves, is the most magical marine environment on Earth. I'm Monty Halls. I'm a marine biologist and diver, and I've always been fascinated by the sea. These animals could give us new insight into our own background. In particular, where we get our gentler side. The area for trade and for self-consumption is the fact that they have no alternatives. So by reactivating agriculture, we hope, one, to increase supply of subsistence crops, two, increase livelihood of families so that they don't have to get into the forest again to pay some basic needs. Research at Wamba Forest has started up again, and Francis White continues to work towards re-establishing the site at Lumaco. My house was over there. Her goal is to find the specific animals that she identified and tracked before the war. Yes? Oh, yes. But in the Congo, simmering tensions could threaten to boil over. Without long-term security, the jungles will remain a place to hunt animals rather than study them. But if research can be re-established and the bonobo protected, who knows what revelations they'll offer. The bonobo's world is a kind of time machine, an important rear window on our own history. Bonobos can provide us with insight, not only into the evolution of intelligence, but into our own social nature as well. Now that they've managed to survive the war, we have the chance to discover more about our peace-loving cousins and possibly find out more about ourselves. Nova's last great ape website, meet an expressive bonobo named Kanzi. See a slideshow of bonobo gestures, explore a primate family tree, and more. Find it on pbs.org. Educators and other educational institutions can order this or other NOVA programs for $19.95 plus shipping and handling. Call WGBH Boston Video at 1-800-255-9424.